and welcome to episode two of Breakfast in the Ruins, a podcast where I, along with friends and fellow travellers, read and chew the fat about the books of Michael Moorcock, as well as a few other authors that fire our imagination in our salad days. Moorcock is widely acknowledged as having a massive influence on the modern fantasy genre, but a number of his works do tip over into the realms of science fiction. On my bookshelves, as well as all manner of pulp sci-fi and fantasy, good and bad, I have the epic and epically massive Encyclopedias of Fantasy and Science Fiction by John Clute and Peter Nichols. I've had these quite a few years now, and I must say I'm pretty chuffed to be able to draw on them for some reasonably practical purpose, other than beating mutant swamp raiders to death. This is a small extract from the multi-page entry on Michael Moorcock. After doing some nightclub work as a blues singer, Moorcock began to contribute SF and fantasy stories to SF Adventures and Science Fantasy. His first SF novel was The Sundered Worlds, later retitled The Blood Red Game, a metaphysical space opera which introduced the concept of the multiverse, a term probably derived from the works of John Cooper Powys. The work describes a universe in which multiple parallel worlds coexist constantly, but never permanently intersected with one another. In this infinite nesting of intersecting arenas, similar cosmic dramas are played and replayed by numerous characters who inhabit the various worlds, but who reduce to a relatively small cast of core identities, each playing himself or herself under various names throughout the nest of worlds. Of these recurring characters, the most central to the heroic fantasy novels is the figure of the Eternal Champion, the protagonist of various series, including the Eternal Champion, or Erika's sequence, Elric of Melniboné, the Warrior of Mars, Hawkmoon, Coram, and Von Beck. These encyclopedias are very, very handy references, and if you have a space big enough on your shelf, and your shelf is strong enough to hold them up, I do recommend picking them up. My first exposure to Moorcock was The Warlord of the Air, a scientific romance blending elements of H.G. Wells, Jules Verne and Edgar Rice Burroughs, believed by some to have created, to a large degree, the steampunk genre. I was gifted The Warlord of the Air along with a 1967 edition of Stormbringer by my granddad back in the day. We'll cover The Warlord of the Air and the continued adventures of Oswald Bastable in later episodes, but today, whilst we're sticking with the science fiction end of his oeuvre, we are covering another of the Big Five characters, and one of the four avatars of the Eternal Champion that have formed the most enduring part of Moorcock's interrelated network of characters, that have defined his output for a generation of geeks, rockers, writers, gamers, and general lovers of vivid, fantastic storytelling. I really should asterisk the notion of a big five in Moorcock and acknowledge that there are numerous other characters, some overtly avatars of the Eternal Champion, others probably not. But for me, Elric, Hawkmoon, Erikos, Coram and Jerry Cornelius were the ones at the forefront of my mind when I was reading these in the early 80s. So that list always rises to the top to this day when I think about his output. I think there's also a strong argument that these five are the most embedded in pop culture memory than the others. I wouldn't call the others lesser characters, because for me they happen to occupy some of my favourite books of Moorcocks. So we'll give Von Beck, Bastable, Jarrett Carnelian and Colonel Pye out their due in good time. But today, we're looking at Hawkmoon. Dorian Hawkman was the subject of seven novels spanning 1969 to 1975, as well as making numerous crossover appearances in other series. The first Hawkman sequence, The History of the Rune Staff, appeared between 67 and 69 and comprised four novels, the first of these being The Jewel in the Skull. The Mayflower edition that made its way to me via my granddad is a fantastic example of how brilliant the presentation of these novels was back in the 70s, and they must have knocked them out in phenomenal numbers as they can still be found from time to time in second-hand shops today, and appear to be no more numerous than any other edition such as the Panther and Grantham ones from the 80s, at least in the UK. On that note, if you're ever in the northwest of England and have the good fortune to be near Markham, pop into the old Pier Bookshop. They have a massive collection of old sci-fi and fantasy, including a pile of those amazing old Moorcock novels from the 60s and 70s that used to be in just about any second-hand bookshop you could find. It's a brilliant place. It's a treasure trove. I'll pop a picture of my copy on the website. It just happens, though, that a large proportion of listeners of the Dreaming City episode aren't in the UK. So for those outside... Please feel free to send me pictures of your editions on Twitter at Breakfast Ruins or via the email address breakfastruins at outlook.com. I'd love to see them and I'll share them in a website gallery. 
Hawkman was also one of the Mocock characters to get 70s comic adaptations too. I have a copy of The Jewel in the Skull somewhere, as adapted by James Cawthorn. If I can dig it out, I'll pop pictures of that on the site too. Sadly, I can't do the same for my old Hawkman role-playing game, as that went the way of a lot of my old gaming gear back in the 90s. I'm still kicking myself now, even though it was never really as good as I wanted it to be, but it did have a gorgeous cover and box, and I'm still a sucker for those old boxed RPGs. We'll have a look at some of those Mocock RPGs at a later date. When I was thinking of starting this podcast, I cast my mind back to an afternoon in the pub some years ago with my old buddy Natasha when we discussed reading habits, and Mocock came up. As a result, Tash was one of the first on my list when I considered who I could co-opt to join me in waffling on about things we read as teenagers, and I was fortunate on two counts. One, she said yes, and two, she's a great talker. So, sit back, take a slurp of ambergine wine, and join us as we talk about The Jewel in the Skull, book one. We're in Natasha's kitchen. We've just eaten a delicious bowl of food. We've got a glass of rum. And uh, we're about to talk about Michael Moorcock. And this occasion, we're talking about Jewel in the Skull. Natasha's laughing at my serious tone. I'm um, trying not to laugh. Um, I'm just impressed we got the name right. I'm like, yeah. That's after a cracking start. <laughs> <laughs> so wh- why don't you tell me a little bit about your history with fantasy and science fiction? I think it's really interesting that if we hadn't said your history with fantasy and science fiction, that the whole conversation could have just gone completely skewed. Yeah. Because, like, the whole world word fantasy doesn't necessarily, you know, people say, what do you like reading? And I'm like, oh, fantasy. Hmm. And like, oh, ah. I'm like, no. <laughs> no. no. Uh, if you're thinking swords and, like, destinies, then we're absolutely on the same page. Yeah. If you're thinking Fifty Shades of fucking emotional abuse, are we allowed to swear? Yes. This is going to be a really short show. <laughs> yeah, so I think I clearly remember buying The Hobbit for my ninth birthday mm. with my money from the bookman who came to school, who, where I went to school, looked really surprised that anybody could afford the book. And mm. I remember him saying, because I placed my order, came to show the books. It was, it was a quiet day for him, you know. And uh, I, I looked at them, read the back. I'm like, ooh, Hobbits. Wrote my order down. And he looked at me. And I, I haven't since had this question in a purchasing environment and he went can you buy that can you afford to pay for that and I'm like yeah it wasn't like wait till he bought it and nick it mm. but it was that part of stoke mm. so um yeah it's my birthday i'm mm. gonna get it bought it read it in a day then there was a git kid in our class who had a git kid a git kid. was that was that freudian slip it so was <laughs> we don't need to go there and i'm not naming names okay. that's a separate story okay. when they Unless you've got no, we haven't got the time. Yeah. So yeah, but he had uh, the Lord of the Rings. Mm. So I finished the Hobbit. And, oh, I read this amazing book, and he lent them to me. And I think I read them. One of those things that I remember reading either in a day or a weekend or something like they were as fantasy books tend mm. to go that just disappeared and they like chocolate. So that was yeah nine. Mm. Pretty good. But then I suppose back in those days, pre iTunes reader. We didn't just have like the access to books or information about books. So when I got to high school, I met another git kid. <laughs> Other separate story. Oh, these people always bought me fantasy books, so hmm. that's karma and destiny all in a fantasy world, isn't hmm. it? So there was, um, she was the youngest daughter and they had loads of older siblings and they just had a house full of books. And I remember reading... I think the next fantasy book I read, I can't remember who wrote it, and it probably isn't that good, but it was The Poisonous Sword, and it was, you know, it was obviously a sword and mm. touched people and he died. It's some kind of really complex story. It's like, yeah, I'm hooked. What else have you got? And they had, like, walls full of, was it Mercedes Lackey? You know, where everyone's gay, and there's loads of magic and pages, and I can't remember anything else. Remember Mercedes no. Lackey? Yeah, we are talking. I'll look it up after this, though. Yeah, yeah, because that's what started. I mean, they weren't the greatest. And then they had, like, Walls full of David Eddings yeah. and Gemmel, you know, not so much. But, you know, it gets to that kind of familiarity. But I got to more cop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> so, 
Can we just try and say it in a different voice every time we have to say his name so it sounds like we've actually edited it? Yes, why not? Excellent. Right, so we got to him at university because it was my friend of my housemate like when I was 19. Hmm. was in. So he liked Hawkwind. He liked all sorts of weird, surreal 70s yeah. shit. And he had a load of fantasy books. So I got back into a circle of people who were into um, fantasy books and he had just this wall of them. Hmm. But I don't remember reading them in order. Hmm. I, I, I don't think anybody read more cooking. Yeah, order. but it was that time of life. I was 19, you know, I don't think... Was I drinking? I don't think I was drinking, but there were certainly uh, intoxicants about. Mm. Um, and it was just fitted in with the background of, you know, 19-year-old life in Sheffield. Mm. So I just remember reading them out of order. I remember getting my Hawkwind in my Eternal Champions confused. I remember mm-hmm. thinking, where's this woman? Is that that person? Yeah. Um, quite a lot. But I loved them. But they're like, um, they're like the fancy equivalent of... Mills and Boone's in size because mm. they can just sit down with one and in a few hours it's gone and you know that's a yeah it, I, I think Moorcock has himself admitted that at one point in the early 70s he was pretty much writing them on the toilet and knocking them out at a phenomenal rate almost in the in, in the same way as a Mills and Boone author yeah and, and in the way that they've enjoyed so yeah. you know there's that match of energy isn't there yeah um, so I was quite happy with it but yeah it didn't make and remembering it didn't make any sense mm. Um, and then obviously I read Behold the Man when I got a little bit older. Oh, and that one stuck in because that yeah. was ever so slightly different. Jesus doesn't come up in many of his other no. novels. No, um, and, and theme. We'll, we'll do an episode on, on Behold the Man. I think that'll be a group one. You yeah, know, like I, all I think different that's probably individual. a really good idea, yeah. yeah. I, I, I discovered Mocock first with Stormbringer, which was one of the first Elric collections, but also chronologically the end of Elric, which is one of the confusing things about reading Michael Mocock. Um, and then just kind of piecemeal and pell-mell went about discovering other bits and pieces and, ah, oh, here's Hawkmoon, here's Coram, ah, oh, the link, sometimes the crossover. And um, it did get quite complicated. Um, and, and I think, essentially, there's absolutely no point whatsoever trying to make a great deal of sense of, of any kind of chronology. That was the interesting thing about it, because I've read a lot of fantasy. I mean, I followed Feist, you know, yeah. from beginning to end. Even past the point where anybody bothered spell checking the fucking things <laughs> they even get. Um, so, you know, I, I've read every single one. It wouldn't occur to me to read them out of order. Yeah. And I will never lend them to somebody else going, oh, why don't you start with, you know, here's the end of this one and I'll give you that one. Mm. And, you know, but in a very similar way, Jimmy the fucking hand is in every book, doesn't matter what they call him, or whether it's his grandson or his granddad, or, you know, like he had five characters and he kept popping up, but he wouldn't recommend it out of order, whereas these, they didn't make sense out of order, but there was a sense of, there's not a sense to be found. Mm. Like, there's not like, the, the, there is no right way to do it. It's like uh, you're eating at a buffet, you don't need to start with the sausage rolls, you can, like, start with a dessert, you can, yeah. it's, it's, it's all entertainment. Yeah. But, yeah, trying to make sense of, when I picked this one back up, yeah, trying to make sense of where it fit, I'm like, oh, fucking hell, it's the beginning. Yeah. And I thought, I'm sure I've read this. I'm sure I didn't read it at the start. And I probably spent half the book thinking it was a different character yeah. and waiting for that person to walk back in it. And But, yeah, it was great to read it afresh without the confusion of the... Because I was really churning through them. You know, when mm. you were a student, you couldn't afford books. Of course. So if you find somebody with a house full of books who lends them to you, um, probably sells you weed. Yeah, and also I think these these like sort of seventies Panther or Mayflower Mocock paperbacks. I mean, Julian the Skull's hundred and fifty six pages. It's it's a quick read. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. Um, I, th- I think it fits the description of pulp fantasy. But you know, there's there's just something about Mocock and and his, his the, the world that he created that just give it a slight edge over most other pulp fiction, which I think is why it has such a massive impact. Um, although it'd be interesting to see kind of what, how much that that impact remains because I have lots of these conversations with people who are my age or slightly younger or slightly older but I'm not sure he's part of the current zeitgeist. I I went in Waterstones the other day and you've got lots and lots of classic science fiction and fantasy authors still in print. What you won't find in the Waterstones is a Michael Moorcock book whereas 20 years ago Michael Moorcock was ubiquitous in brand new bookshops and in second hand bookshops you would always find at least a dozen of those beautiful 70s Mayflower paperback editions with the psychedelic covers. And that's a real shame, but I wonder why that is. We'll probably tease that out as we, as we discuss. Two words, my friend. I can save you time. Tits and dragons. So, <laughs> like, modern fantasy fans, mm. yeah, uh, they were sold the tits and dragons dream, and that's what they expect. And he doesn't do tits or dragons. Mm. Um, he does... 
vast universes that aren't built on merch, which is the other big fantasy alleged sci-fi draw. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to get, you know, we could spend hours me just dissing Star Wars if you want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I suppose that is one of the interesting things. He was, he was, not, he was non-typical... Um, in the sixties and the seventies, because of what he was doing, he's, I don't know. I think I think it's been described as progressive, transgressive, whatever we want to call him. Um, but also because of that kind of mad um, switch in what now constitutes fantasy, which I think the Eddings and the Gemmells were to some degree, you know, in, influential on. And I, 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 I must tell my hands up. I've never read a David Eddings book or a David Gemmell book. Probably just because I'm lazy and the size of them is intimidating. And I like my 150 page Mopac novel or, or, or something similar. Um, but yeah, it's, it is a shame. And th- they did republish a lot of these in new volumes with further tinkering from Mopac because he's certainly not been immune to going back and tinkering with his, his own work a little bit, George Lucas style. But I think that was a few years ago and, and they're not available in bookshops anymore. But interestingly, you said, you said that you, you started with The Hobbit and you started with The Lord of the Rings. And there are. There is something of a schism in the whole fantasy fan community, especially the community that I interact with sometimes on Twitter, which is largely <laughs> role-playing game nerd-based. But there is kind of a schism between the Mocock people and the Tolkien people with the person in the middle saying, well, I like both, what's wrong with that? But if I started with The Hobbit. My mum read me The Hobbit when I was a kid, and then once I was able to pick it up myself, I read it myself, that old lovely Unwin hardback with the beautiful... Tolkien image on the cover. And then probably a few years later via my granddad got hold of Stormbringer and well there's quite a considerable difference <laughs> between the two. So how did you how did you find the journey from Tolkien to Moorcock and and what in the Moorcock books that you read when you were at university spoke to you and kind of made it feel different? I think by the time I'd got to university, having gone through my friend's family's library of whatever. Didn't get on with Gamma myself. Eddings was, and what isn't in this book or in more cross books, you can't fit it in 156 pages, just a lot of walking and talking, just chatting, you know, like that kind of camaraderie thing. Yeah, you've got your, you've got your plot arc, right, we need to get this this time, so we're going to walk over here and we're going to get it and on the way we'll have a chat and things will happen and we'll have a chat about it and tell you a joke and a bit of a story and that was kind of a uh, so that was a little bit Tolkien without the kind of vastness of the Tolkien yeah. world. <clears throat> so by the time we got to Mocha, I'd read quite a lot <laughs> of whatever. Travel just, logs. Yeah, travel logs. So to get something that was like, and a month later, and then a week later, and then a month later, and, you know, they just fucking went. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to read about every meal yeah. or... You know, so it was in that sense. It was it was different. I mean, the things that I I mean, I love the. I mean, who can't love the artwork? I mean, yeah. I got mine from a second hand store, and they had the newer versions. It's like no, no, the weirder the front, like the more the more cock. Yeah, yeah. So we've we've both got the same uh, Mayflower edition, haven't we? With the what looks to be weird airbrushed artwork of a dude holding some rugby posts with a skull head with a jewel in the centre of the forehead and. A blackbird or a crow over the head of some weird dude who's living in a hole in Skullhead's clock. It's very strange. Yeah, and there's a bottle of Chambord with a crucifix on it. <laughs> yeah, there is. yeah, yeah, there's Chambord there just in case. Just in case. Yeah, and, and they're, they're absolutely fantastic covers. Yeah, and all of them were. Like, yeah. all of them were. It wasn't that. Um, you know the nineties cover with the horse and the pale blue yeah. and the embossed writing. It wasn't that shit. Yeah. It was like. Hello. Yeah. And you could just, you know, especially given the rest of the things I was doing when I was 19, you could really stare at the front of the book and have a great time. Yeah. Um, it was, it stood apart. It stood apart in its size. It stood apart in its approach. As I say, the fact that you could just slot them in out of order and still feel part of the world. And because you're always going to be a little bit confused. Um, so, like, it didn't really, it didn't add or take away. It was almost that. It was like the puzzle of trying to get them in order in your own brain would have been like part of the entertainment of it. Because even if you read them in like numerical order, because I think I said to my friend, oh, shall I start with the first one? He was like, don't do that. That's yeah. stupid. And I think it might have been Stormbringer he gave me. It's like, yeah. start with this one and then just go with the cover. I'm like, okay. But yeah, it was a different way to eat fantasy, wasn't it? Hmm. Than the other ways, which are very, very, very prescriptive. Yeah, we've got a distinct advantage with Jew in the School because it actually says on the cover the first volume in the history of the room stuff, 
Whereas the Elric books, well, you're buggered if you can figure out what order they're in, <laughs> other than you read Stormbringer and get to the end and find out that's the end of the Elric saga, even though it's one of the, the earliest published books. So we decided to, to take a, a punt at the Jewel in the Skull, didn't we? Largely because you found it in a charity shop. Yep. And it was ready to <clears> roll. So, I mean, the, the great thing about... Um, I think the great thing about starting with Hawkmoon, which I don't think is necessarily one of the ones I would have started with initially, because my gumption would have been to start with the one I read first. But the good thing about starting with this is it's actually quite self-contained in terms of story, and doesn't really start to spill over in the other stuff until the second trilogy. So this is a nice self-contained beginning, and also I think the first couple of chapters really are classic Moorcock. And they display all of the traits say, of classic like, Moorcock. It's like a tasting menu of mm. Moorcock. Like you read it and like, oh yeah, that's brought it all back to me. Like everything about the style, about the universes, about the characters, about yeah. the... Yeah, it was all... Yeah. I don't need to read the rest. <laughs> I think somewhere at the back of my unconscious, it's all like filtered into its own like narrative. And yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's done. I will though. Yeah, so well, let's let's get into it then. Um, and I suppose, just, just for clarity, we're only going to cover book one of Duel in the Skull today, which is the first third, which actually turns out tells about the first 38 pages. We'll cover other bits subsequently. I think by the time we get to some of the subsequent books, we'll probably cover them all in one go, because there is a distinct difference in quality between the Duel in the Skull and, for example, the Sword of the Dawn, which I think he really did right for the bog. Um, but we can get to that in due time. So it, it kicks off with a, an armoured man on horseback, patrolling the land that, I don't think he liberated it from a villainous presence, but he's, he now rules this this kind of unusual land. The opening paragraph anchors the background in quite recognisable territory, the Camargue in France, and he passes by uh, the ruins of an old Gothic church, which establishes that essentially this is set in some version of the Europe that we understand. But very quickly, actually, the very next paragraph, we've got references to white bulls, horned horses, and scarlet flamingos that can be ridden by men. So, very quickly, in the space of two paragraphs, very spare language, we've got our introduction to a key character, a little bit of world building, and that kind of continues throughout the first character. We get a reference to the nature of the kind of monsters in this setting, the type of technology, which is highly weird. Um, and a little bit about the character, this character, Count Brass, and an element of his history, the nature of his domain, and the threats inherent. And this all takes place, really, over the space of a couple of pages that you digest and read very, very quickly. And you also get a little bit of action as well, just to, to kick things off. So I'm going to quickly read from the book the description of Count Brass, because I think it's a really good example of how Mocock writes and, and defines characters. And given, I think, before you start with that, yeah. that the first, as you say, the first paragraph sets the scene and yeah. the time and the relatedness to our universe, and the second paragraph then sets the difference, given how much time he describes, how many times he mentions the word brass in that paragraph, yeah. is, is, you know, it's more cross style, you know. Have you noticed? He's not just called Count Brass, but he actually is Brassy Count. Mm. In fact, so. check this out. The sky was a light grey, carrying rain, and from it shone sunlight of watery gold, touching the Count's armour of burnished brass and making it glow like flame. The Count wore a huge broadsword at his hip, and a plain helmet, also of brass, was on his head. His whole body was sheathed in heavy brass, and even his gloves and boots were of brass links sewn upon leather. The Count's body was broad, sturdy and tall, and he had a great strong head on his shoulders, with a tanned face that might also have been moulded of brass. From this head stared two steady eyes of golden brown. His heavy moustache was red, as was his hair. In the Camargue, as well beyond it, it was not unusual to hear the legend that the Count was, in fact, not a true man at all, but a living statue in brass. A titan, invincible, indestructible, and immortal. So yeah, brass, 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 brass. Yeah. But the first thing that struck me when I was reading this again, for the first time in a long time, was basically it's describing Brian Blessed in series one of Blackadder. Because Brian Blessed wears that kind of burnished brass armour with the gauntlets on his shoulder and yeah. red and he's got the big hair. Okay, he's got a beard as well as a moustache. But I thought, if you were cast in this and you were making the film 25, 30 years ago, this would be Brian Blessed. It would always be Brian Blessed. Yeah. I would use Brian Blessed like Tom Cruise's use. You could be every character in every <laughs> yeah. film. Yeah. Um, interestingly, it was actually recently announced that the makers of Good Omens on Prime, 
are going to do an adaptation of the history of the room staff. Brian Blessed now is sadly too old, so who on earth could play Count Brass now? This is a tricky one. We'll maybe come back to this at the end on our casting couch. I'm, I'm blown away by the uh, Brian Blessed's too old assertion. Well, not only is Brian Blessed too old, I think now, to get away with playing Count Brass, he's also quite short, which was a big surprise. We went to a geeky sci-fi convention last year and met him, and actually earlier this year. Lovely fella, but his presence on TV leads you to suggest, leads you to believe that he's going to be some kind of giant. Again, we apply the Tom Cruise technology. Mm, what lifts? Be, yeah, six, <laughs> six foot seven. If Tom Cruise can be Reacher, yeah. then uh, Brian can be anything he wants. So he just needs lifts in his yeah. pumps and everything will be fine. Like it's camera angles. Yeah. I think the guy, uh, well, actually we'll get to casting later on. So, as, as we continue, we get a little description of the world. So, that a previous Lord G- Guardian... Sorry, just top of the room. I don't know what the more glass. There we go. Yeah. Um, the previous Lord Garden, Guardian, a uh, pretty terrible person, and it gives us a good idea of what kind of nasties we get in this kind of setting. So, paragraph two on page 11. I could edit out all these ridiculous pauses as I find things like this. You could leave them in for the reality of it. So, we know that the Count... He's out on his, uh, on his patrol, visiting the guys who, the guardians who occupy his towers that defend the land, which have all sorts of strange technology um, in order to defend the Camargue. And he knows that out in the marshes there are Baragoons. And Baragoons are the product of the previous Lord Guardian, who was a nasty piece of work. And there's a really nice description of the Baragoons that goes thus, he says... It was a slithering sound, a slobbering sound, the sound of a baragoon, the marsh gibbera. I think gibber is a really great word. Few of the monsters were left now. They'd been the creations of the former guardian who'd used them to terrorise the people of the Camargue before Count Brass came. Count Brass and his men had all but destroyed the race, but those which remained had learned to hunt by night and avoid large numbers of men at all costs. The baragoons had once been men themselves before they'd been taken as slaves to the former guardian's sorceress laboratories and there transformed. Now there were monsters eight feet high and some five feet broad, bile-coloured and slithering on their bellies through the marshlands, rising only to leap upon and rend their prey with steel-hard talons. When they did, on occasion, have the good fortune to find a man alone, they would take slow vengeance, delighting in eating a man's limbs before his very eyes. So, you know, pretty nasty, unpleasant beasties, nice description of a monster, quite unlike anything I think that I'd read, for example, in Tolkien, Robert E. Howard had a good turn of phrase when it came to describing beasts and monsters, but Conan mostly killed other people, and occasionally a white gorilla or something like that. Monsters weren't really the core of Conan. And I think the the description of the Baragoon is really, really interesting because there's, there's something else which makes it a, a much more interesting encounter than just the Count having the chance to show his martial prowess for the sake of the reader. So the Count confronts the Baragoon and effectively taunts it. It tries to respond, but fails miserably. And again, the text says, The Baragoon's gibber and shout of rage was loud, but not without a hint of uncertainty. It shuffled its bulk, but did not move towards the Count. Count Brass laughed. Well, cowardly creation of sorcery. What's your answer? The monster opened its mouth and tried to frame a few words with its misshapen lips, but little emerged that could be recognised as human speech. Its eyes did not now meet the Count Brasses. And that's really tragic and, and deeply unpleasant because this creature, which is out there kind of killing men, feels shame at being reduced to this, this mess that it now is. And that's, I remember reading this when I was probably 16, 17, and instantly I'm being led to identify with a hideous gibbering marsh beast that the Count is about to dispatch to prove his prowess. So it's just something a little bit different, because the, the monsters in other fantasy, Tolkien included, are pretty two-dimensional. Whereas here, instantly, on three pages, we've established the setting, we've established the land, we've established elements of Count Brass's character, and we've been introduced to a monster, which actually I automatically feel sorry for, because it's evident that he feels shame for what it is, which is, in three pages, is pretty tight writing. That is, when is it his best, that is exactly what he does. He pins it down a few words and it has layers within layers within layers. 
So I remember when I read these probably the first time, I read them quite quickly. And there were so several pages in this, I read them over and over, partly because I kept putting it down and doing mm. things, and partly because I was like, well, actually, there's quite a lot in that. <laughs> so, mm. you know, it's worth taking the time, as I'm going to be literally talking about it live in the public space, then uh, it's probably worth, like, really understanding what's there, instead of, like, churning through it like it is in Mills and Boone. Oh, the sky was grey, oh, yeah. three pages, oh, it's a big hill, oh, three pages, oh, look, there's a castle. Fucking hell, he's not going to get to the castle today. He's going to have to describe the castle again tomorrow. You know, it's that kind of approach. So yeah. it was... Sorry. I should probably mention for, for the audience that the bang in the background is occasionally a happy dog. <laughs> um, it's, it's not like nervous jittering. It's just a tail wagging. I've got quite a satisfied sleepy dog on my side. Yeah. Yeah, um, so, so there's something dramatically more satisfying about that encounter. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. And, and also, and he gives you a sense of the approach of the book because it is a compassionate kind of take on a hard situation mm. it is a considered approach to a response to war by Camp Brass for mm. example so you know, I don't want to skip too many pages ahead but he's got some you know thoughts about mm. why why don't we just fight the bad guys yeah. it's not just oh bad guys charge yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah you know same with the Baragoon I think if the, if it had turned tail and run away he was prepared to probably let it leave because well, was... I think the text actually says that um he, he gives it the opportunity to leave knowing that it won and knowing yeah. it's going to kill it. But it's just all part of his process. So he's whilst he's obviously heroic, big, buff, the master of his own land, he gives this creature an opportunity to go, but he knows it's not going to. Yeah, and, he ends up, and he lops its head off, pretty it much. It doesn't measure. have to uh, fight everybody he sees for the sake of the good. No. And, uh, you know, it's not the crusader, it's the, well, maybe, you know... Hmm. Not wasting time, this one could. Yeah. No, it doesn't. But... Yeah, so it's cool. It, it culminates with a, a, a nice, uh, gory description of some action. He, he pretty much lops its head mostly off and it slithers back off into the uh, into the swamp with a push of his boot. And he gets back on his horned horse and heads back to, uh, to his castle. Chapter 2 is quite different in that it ends with a three, essentially three pages of exposition which describe the land... Describe Camp Brass as a, essentially a game changer, a combination of mercenary, extraordinaire, and political mover and shaker, who accepted gigs where he thought he could always influence the courts of Europe for the better. Because what we've got is like a, a feudal Europe, almost of city, warring city states, and he's been out there for decades, essentially picking the side he thought could potentially lead to more stability. So he's established as having this desire to see a more stable Europe, which comes into play a little bit further on in these chapters, where potentially his character becomes a little bit more nuanced, um, for good or for ill. So this version of Europe is in flux, and he's settled in the Camargue, an isolated place in the south of France, or what was called France. And at this point we get a much more detailed reference to the big villains, which were referenced very briefly in the first chapter, the Empire of Grand Bretagne. Which, um, once again, for a book from 1967, only 22 years removed from World War II, is quite an interesting take on the whole dark empire that wants to take over the world business. When reading it as a teenager, I found out, oh, right, we the British are the villains. And there's all sorts of ways to kind of consider and think about that. There's a, a little paragraph which goes into a little bit of detail about Grand Britain. In the West lay the island empire of Grand Britain, the only nation with any real political stability, with her half-insane science and her ambitions of conquest. Having built the tall, curved bridge of silver that spanned 30 miles of sea, the empire was bent on increasing her territories by means of her black wisdom and her war machines like the brazen ornithopters that had a range of more than 100 miles. But even the encroachment of the dark empire into the mainland of Europe did not greatly disturb Count Brass. It was a law of history, he believed, that such things must happen and he saw the ultimate benefits that could result from a force, no matter how cruel, capable of uniting all the warring states into one nation. So, once again, we're only five pages in, and Count Brass is taking on yet another dimension, in that he's being described effectively like a 1930s appeaser of an aggressive nation that's trying to impose itself on Europe, which is changes the game slightly on Count Brass, I think, because on the one hand we've got this big heroic dude who's not even the main protagonist of these novels, because these novels are about Hartman, but he's already established as 
someone who potentially, well, he could go either way. So that kind of leads a little bit of uncertainty. So, so nothing is black and white. Nothing is clear cut. And as you said earlier, we've already established that he's not the kind of guy who, if politically something occurs, he's not going to go, I'm going to be the good guy and fight for the good guys, which is quite revealing. I'm sure Brian Blessed would have. <laughs> he'd, he'd, he'd have... I'm sure by the time it's on TV it will be. Yeah. I'm sure there will be absolutely yeah, one side or the other. Well, there can maybe de age blessed. Yeah. You never know with all this new technology. Um, so Brass remains aloof of the developments, and you know, obviously this won't be for long because we've got our villains in the novel. Grand Britannia is grabbed as already, in con- already having conquered much of Europe already, and then we get some descriptions of, of the area. So we've got Parai, which is obviously a standard for Paris. Munchen, Wien, Krakow, and Koenigsberg, the westernmost stronghold of mysterious Muscovia. So we're getting drip-fed little elements as well about the nature of Europe in what's later described, I think, as tragic millennium era Europe. So soon, Brass kind of realises that only the Camargue will soon be free of the Dark Empire. So as this was written in 1967, it's clearly analogous to World War II and the Nazi rampage across Europe, but with a clear difference of Grand Britain being the aggressors. You see, I didn't take that, but I looked at it. I suppose I was sitting in a bar in Norway yeah. <laughs> at the time, yeah. and we are theoretically, well, I'm not even saying theoretically, there's some bullshit talk about Brexit, whatever. Yeah. And so I'd seen it as a bit of a... Because 67, if it was 47, hmm. I'd be like, yeah, that's... But when I read his wiki and it was talking about being an anarchist, I'm like, mm. it could be any response. And I thought the fact that they introduced brass as they did as this, well, you know, actually, maybe for a little bit more unified, there'd be fewer wars, but then, you know, does it matter who does it? Kind of those kinds of considerations. Mm. I'm like, it's just any globalism. Because mm. by 67, he'd have seen the end of, um, he'd have seen the creation of Israel, mm. if he's an anarchist, mm. you know, so we're in this modern world of our understanding of news, but he, if you, as an anarchist in the 60s, and obviously there's the other kind of and subcultures in the 60s, you would have mm. been leading up to all sorts of other American wars, and, you know, Lord knows the British weren't being particularly friendly. Mm. Read, I would say to the audience, have a look at Mark Curtis, the modern historian, and just mm. find out about some of our activities in the last sort of hundred years that are now like public knowledge mm. it's in that context if we don't think of it as in the propagandist because i yeah. didn't take it that way i really took it as you know well anybody who brings kind of peace but you know these were mo- these were monsters and he was talking about like this three thousand year old as we will get to him later you know so so it's an aged empire yeah. it's not a new thing and actually if we look at where the age thing is and again if we're going to send people to youtube it'd be um alan Watts. There's an Alan Watts and there's an Alan Watts. One guy's great for talking about spirituality and meditation and like how he just needs to chill out and not think yeah. about the world. And the other one's great well, for telling about... Them as well, then. Yeah. yeah, so both of them, like, check both of them out. <laughs> like, if you find the guy who tells you how fucked the world is first, mm. then you can watch the other guy afterwards and just mm. chill out about it. But there's two Alan Watts plus or minus and yeah. But in terms of, like, a global agenda, then if he really genuinely was an anarchist in the 60s, he'd be more like Bilderberg, he'd mm. be more Rothschild, he'd be more like, it doesn't matter whether you mm. defeated the Nazis, but I was there at the time, and I know IBM was selling the things to make the, you know, the gas chambers work, and, yeah. you know, so we, he might have been, in a way that people may be not now, because there's a very different take of reality because mm. it's influenced by so many things he would have had books because what what reinforced it is at the back of this version that we've got there's a there's an advert for a book that i thought oh i wonder if that's still imprinted but it fucking isn't the, the warning of the magicians which is talking about the um hitler and his frozen and hollow earth uh, theories. Oh, of course, yeah. um so he wasn't in that camp of you know he wasn't a tits and dragons kind of author yeah he could have been you know, it could have been referred to, and I think he's probably been very wise, given that it was post World War Two, yeah. to not be very clear to say, well, if Britain had won, what if we were the bad guys? Ah. But to even suggest that isn't all power corrupt, yeah. and aren't we right to question authority? And again, from his wiki thing, apparently across all of the books, they quite often start as being some kind of lord or landed gentleman, and they end up realizing that they they really need to own their own authority and their authenticity, and that's where peace and mm. and justice lies. Because if you let any man tell you what to do for any reason, you're probably going to be selling down the wrong kind of. Mm. 
So that's so that's how I took it because in this allegedly Brexit, not Brexit, we're globalized, so you can't take it back. We're either going to be in the camp with them, we're going to be in a camp with the Mary. You can't opt out of a of yeah. a round world. But who's behind that, and how innocent is that, and and what's the fallout and the damage? And either you are because it goes on. You know, all these villages that were conquered by the Grand Britain were um, they either served or they died. Yeah. And actually, is that not? written into our modern laws in everywhere because yeah. if you say yeah, anything yeah, yeah. that isn't about serving then you are a terrorist and we have laws that can have you disappeared into camps and interred or mm. deported or do you know what I mean I don't want to go into it now because I don't want to be deported particularly mm. but it's it's that context so I thought he worked and, and the way he's so brief in his descriptions allows the reader to take what they mm. so you project your own shit on it you know yeah. or what's going through your mind in the minute so if you want to be like oh well what if the English were the bad guys I'm like what if we're still the bad guys mm. ask the people in the Yemen mm. I don't think they think that you know we're not Nazis because mm. why would they no, that's a really that's a really good reading of it and I think my reading of it is probably completely coloured by the fact that I read it in my granddad's living room with the pictures of him in his World War Two uniform and everything else, and and with Kelly's heroes <laughs> <laughs> fresh in my brain or anything else. But no, that's that's absolutely bang on. You know, the, the bottom line is uh, in this, in terms of story, what, whatever we read into it, the British are the baddies, and Camp Brass is tempted to appease him because he has a, a feeling that Europe needs stability by any means. And, you know, we'll see, kind of, as, as the book goes, um, whether he sticks with that. Spoiler. <laughs> he doesn't. <laughs> we get on to Erg Mortez, which is his, basically his castle. So we get a description of Castle Brass, and it says, The castle had been built some centuries before, and what had then been an artificial pyramid rising high above the centre of the town. But now the pyramid was hidden by earth, in which had been planted grass and gardens for flowers, vines, and vegetables in a series of terraces. Here there were well-kept lawns on which the children of the castle could play, or adults stroll. There were the grapevines that gave the best wine in the Camargue, and further down great rows, sorry, further down grew rows of haricots and patches of potatoes, cauliflowers, carrots, lettuce, and many other common vegetables, as well as more exotic ones like the giant pumpkin tomatoes, celery trees, and sweet ambergines. Mmm, ambergines. There were also fruit trees and bushes that supplied the castle throughout most of the seasons. So he's, he's kind of got his own little patch of paradise, which he's, he's fought hard for. So you can kind of understand, to a degree, why he doesn't want kind of conflict or why he might be minded to, to mind his own business. We then get introduced to two more key characters. Um, Yzelda, his 19-year-old daughter, um, who naturally, because she's the daughter of the big heroic count, she's gorgeous, she wears glowing robes of Samite, etc, etc, etc. And Bo Gentle, who essentially is a poet-philosopher who is Count Brass's closest advisor and really, to some degree, functions as a counterbalance to the Count's quite cynical view of the polit- political situation. Both are very protective of the Count, both fear for him when he voyages abroad alone, and they also discuss Von Villac, the Count's chief lieutenant, who is another old soldier, who once again is another key key component. Bo Gentle's not terribly impressed with the Count's opinion about whether Grand Britain are a necessary force and their methods are not as important as the result of their create. And Bo Gentle actually describes some of the, the depravities of Grand Britain. Bo Gentle changed the subject. I heard today that Grand Britain took the province of Colm not six months past, he said. Their conquest spread like a plague. A healthy enough plague, Count Brass replied, settling back in his chair. At least they establish order. Political order, perhaps, Bo Gentle said with some fire, but scarcely spiritual or moral. Their cruelty is without precedent. They are insane. Their souls are sick with a love for all that is evil and a hatred for all that is noble. Count Brass stroked his moustache. Such wickedness has existed before. Why, the Bulgar sorcerer who preceded me was quite as evil as they the Bulgar was an individual. So are the Maquis of Pesht, Roldar, Nikolaev, and their kind, but there were exceptions. And in almost every case, the people they led revolted against them and destroyed them in time. But the Dark Empire is a nation of such individuals, and such actions as they commit are seen as natural. In Colm, their sport was to crucify every girl child in the city, make eunuchs of the boys, and have all the adults who would save their lives perform lewd displays in the streets. That is no natural cruelty count, and was by no means their worst. 
their entertainment is to debase all humanity. So they're not only evil invaders of Europe, they're also dirty pervs yeah. and evil murderers of children, which in terms of what we see on the news and what we see in politics isn't that unusual, but it was unusual at the time when I'm reading fantasy books when I'm 17 in, I don't know, 1989 or whatever, to have something slightly more than orcs burning villages or, you know, people being dragged off to work in a villain's mines. The prettiest woman being taken to be the wife of the prince. Yes. So this, this was But quite... eventually coming to appreciate it. Oh, naturally. Obviously. Naturally. And we'll see sort of the slight edge of that <laughs> in the next chapter, won't we? So, yeah, Grand Bretagne clearly established as dirty, rotten scoundrels. Well, scoundrels is the wrong word. Awful, awful people and a terrible, terrible force. But despite this, Count Brass is still slightly resistant to, uh, to condemning them, which is somewhat worrying for who essentially is at this point still seems to be the main character of the story. Right, so we next join... Brass, Giselda and Bargentle, and Von Villach, old Von Villach, at the, uh, at the local amphitheatre, thought by the Count to have been built in ancient times by the Romanians. <laughs> so it's the festival of the life wind, the coming of the Mistral, and the greatest bullfight of the year, Matan Just, will first corner Rouge, the mightiest of the white bulls. In um, what follows and is a description of a, a bullfight, it's non-violent because, remarkably, this is a humane bullfight, where the objective is to snatch garlands from around the bull's neck. And Corner Rouge wins and bests Matan Just. Hooray, hooray for the white bull. But that just, of course, gives the Count an opportunity to flex his muscles. In a way, save a little bit of face from the last chapter, whereas it was quite disappointing as a character in some ways for me. And he gets to face down the bull. Did he want him to be more righteous? Well, yeah, I suppose so. I suppose it's, 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 it's my, my, that's my failure. But of course, there wouldn't be any drama if there wasn't an arc for the character, was there? But really, what I want is the Count to go, yeah, these Grand Britannians are assholes, let's have at them. Has, but that's part of the characterisation, that's part of the narrative. It's interesting how he does any arc, given how short it is. You know, and again, if you're going to compare with someone like Eddings, and I'm not trying to suggest that Eddings is my favourite, I'm just saying there was a lot of them and they were free. You love Eddings, <laughs> admit it. We love Eddings. <laughs> no, no. But you have to develop it somehow. And mm. he manages to develop it with a sentence here, a sentence there, oh. a 150-page total book, Yeah, which is an... Insane, really. In, in modern ways, mm. there'd have to be so many other... You'd have to see how he treated his dog and see how he talked to his horse and see how he mm. was with his servants and see how he'd ruled and what the history was ruling, what his dad did, but who influenced him, whether his wife loved him or she was poisoning him every day. There'd be a whole lot more fucking development mm. to a character the size of Count Brass mm. in every other fantasy writer's world, where this guy is... You drop it here, you drop it there, but, you know, he's a hero. Mm. He's a hero and he just wants a quiet life with his, you know... Aubergine mutants. Yeah. And, you know. he's, he's pumpkin tomatoes and his ambergines. <laughs> the ambergines, yeah. that's it. Yeah. And I love the way that, you know, because the, it, it was built on an old pyramid, so everyone's like, ooh, you know, secret powers and, yeah. you know, like energy. But it's just built on a py- pyramid and they had cabbages. I'm like, <laughs> 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 it just moves briskly on, but yeah. it, it's all there for the reader. So, uh, again, I, I'm, not, I'm not upset to see that he was a... Uh, the more chilled out at the start and he has to be convinced why he yeah. can be asked to fight again because, you know, the cabbages are fine. Yeah. Um, I think I, that I, gives I, him I, a realism. I'll tell you where I think my, my vague sense of disappointment comes from is reading this as a teenager and thinking Count Brass was the, the dog's bollocks. And for me, well, we haven't actually got to the character of Dorian Hawkmoon yet, but for me, Count Brass is a much more interesting character than Hawkmoon. And Hawkmoon's actually a bit boring, like Murcock's main protagonists normally are. Count Brass was awesome. So I'm reading it again with fresh eyes as a 47-year-old rather than, I don't know, 17-year-old uh, so or whatever. Down. And he's letting me down a little bit. Yeah, he's letting me down a little bit. But that said, we're in the third chapter of four chapters, which basically comprise book one. And this is this is just basically Count Brass's arc, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's Count Brass's arc in 38 pages. And, and this is what it's about. So I've, I've just got to hold my hand up and accept that, number one, yes, I have that vague sense of disappointment, but I know it's going to come through. You know, no spoilers, everybody, but he will come through. But anyway, at the moment, he's wrestling the biggest, hardest white bull in the arena, turning it over and lording it over it, and then holding up the hands of Matan Just, the bullfighter, to say, he won, he got the garlands, and everybody, of course, loves Count Brass because he's a massive beefcake. 
and he's just saved everybody's like local hero in a, in the human bullfight, which okay. is kind of cool. And you know they love the new boss because they hate the old boss. Yeah, so well that always works. It does always yeah. help. And the old boss was a wanger. Exactly. A serious wanger. Yeah, it's, it's all perhaps a little bit cheesy that you know, hard man wrestles the bull, but you know it kind of restores some semblance of um, the count as a larger than life, super heroic, monolithic character. Um, but it's, it's you know his politics soon get tested because they return to count uh, to Castle Brass and find that they've got a visitor. And it's instantly obvious that the visitor is, well, ostentatious, to say the least, because the description of his ride uh, really gives you a, a pretty good idea of, uh, of what this lot are like. Count Brass looked hard at the carriage. It was of beaten metal of dark gold, steel and copper, inlaid with mother of pearl, silver and onyx. It was fashioned to resemble the body of a grotesque beast, with its legs extending into claws, which clutched the wheel shafts. Its head was reptilian, with ruby eyes hollowed out from above to form a seat for the coachman. On the doors was an elaborate coat of arms displaying many quarterings in which were strange-looking animals, weapons and symbols of an obscure but disturbing nature. Count Brass recognised the design of the carriage and the coat of arms. The first was the workmanship of the Mad Smiths of Grand Britain. The second was the coat of arms of one of that nation's most powerful and infamous nobles. It is Baron Melidas of Croydon, Count Brass said as he dismounted. Baron Melidas of Croydon. <laughs> if you've been to Croydon. <laughs> yeah. I have been to Croydon. Exactly. And, it's uh, a joke that tells itself. Yeah, it's, and it's, 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 it's just another nice little kind of mocock gag. Because yeah. I, I had to look this up because I had my kind of instincts about Croydon, having visited it probably <laughs> 15, 20 years ago. But in the 60s, Croydon, and people listening to this might... If they are from Croydon, I do apologise. We apologise that you're from Croydon. Yeah, um, we, we tell you that there's trains every hour up north yeah. and it's safe up here. Yeah, so it's, in 1967, Croydon was like at the tail end of a concerted effort, which was the Croydon Corporation Act, to encourage big business to move out of central London. So all of a sudden, concrete tower, office towers and multi-storey car parks kind of sprung up and it was the 60s vision of what the future would look like. A J.G. Ballard-esque high-rise nightmare. And the initiative wasn't entirely successful, and it was the Nancys before efforts were made to actually address the reputation of Croydon for being a 60s <laughs> concrete monstrosity. It wasn't entirely successful. <laughs> it was a new one of the day. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, if, if you want to look at old city centre developments comparison, just, just look at somewhere like Coventry. Or, having visited it a couple of times... Stoke's not really that great in terms of city centre planning and probably suffered a little bit from 50s and 60s concretism. I think Stoke people would challenge the word planning <laughs> in association with the FAC. Um, well, we had a fair bit of it in Hull as well, given that you know Hull was um, bombed pretty drastically in World War II. So we've got our fair share of I was of, asking of the lady in Oslo, it's like because the buildings are beautiful. I'm like, did they bomb here? And they're like, well, we think we bombed further north. And like, yeah. she looked at me, she's like, why did they bomb your town? I'm like, no, the Germans left it to us. Like, you're <laughs> suffering enough, just fucking keep it. <laughs> Have your plates. You need something. Yeah. So, yeah, and then they took away the plates just to, to <laughs> no. the story of Stoke. <laughs> yeah, so I can. Yeah. Well, my first visit to Stoke was when we were about 20, and uh, my friend went to university there, and possibly the most exciting thing was the Pottery Museum. Yeah, uh, although they did do very good kebabs. Anyway, we digress. So, yeah, the idea that it's the, the, the big bad is Baron Melidas of Croydon, I just, I, it made me, I think it passed me by a little bit when I was 17, but now I just found it hugely entertaining. Having been to Croydon since I was 17, I think that's probably what really brings it home. Yeah. Um, Croydon, as an incidental, is where they set phone shop, if you watch that Channel 4 yeah. comedy series. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's worth going out. It's actually quite surprisingly difficult to get hold of. I think Amazon occasionally have the DVDs. Right, okay. Very, very funny. The guy who did uh, phone shop. But yeah, set in Croydon. And if you imagine one of those in this setting with his big horse and yep. his coat of arms, you'd pretty much be, but you know, a little bit more twisted. Mm. But, yeah. Of course, you know, there's, there's a slight um, fudging or, or clouding of that because it's spelled Croydon, K-R-O-I-D-E-M, or D-E-N, I should say. You know, just, uh, but nevertheless, it's Croydon. We the know. villain is the Baron of Croydon, which I've got to say I love. But actually, it comes across first up as pretty swish. He's uh, very courteous. 
He praises the count, he kisses Yazelda's hand, obviously impressed by her beauty, and uh, he tries to butter up Bo Gentle by saying that he loves his writings and his philosophy, but Bo Gentle's not really having much of it, he's not happy at all, he's trying to contain himself, not happy having him there at all. And of course he gets Von Villac on side just by talking about his old war stories and, and the battles that he was involved in. But there is a level of tension, thanks to Bo Gentle. The Baron himself is described thus. The Baron was almost as tall as Count Brass. He was dressed all in gleaming back, black and dark blue. Even his jewelled animal mask, which covered the whole of his head like a helmet, was of some strange black metal, with deep blue sapphires for eyes. The mask was cast in the form of a snarling wolf, with needle-sharp teeth in the open jaws. Standing in the shadows of the hall, his black cloak covering much of his black armour, Baron Melidas might have been one of the mythical beast gods that were still worshipped in the lands beyond the Middle Sea. As they entered, he reached up with a black gauntleted hand and removed the mask, revealing a white, heavy face with well-trimmed black beard and moustache. His hair too was black and thick, and his eyes were a strange pale blue. The Baron was apparently unarmed, perhaps as an indication that he came in peace. So, he's dressed like a villain. Sounds like a sleaze. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. sounds like a sleaze. He's got his dirty tash, which yeah. is nicely groomed, but he's dressed like a villain. If you're all in black and you've got a black snarling wolf mask and a black cape and everything else, you're dressed like a villain. But he's, he's giving it a pretty good go. But then when you're from Croydon, you've got to do what you can. Yeah. Step it up. This True. is the days before baseball caps and low slung jeans. Uh, but, you know, he's he's got a villainous ride. Yep. He's got a villainous outfit. And despite the fact that he's being um, very courteous, you know, he's, he's, he's a wrong one. He's playing that he's a wrong one. So after Bo Gentle Von Villac and his I elder... I think the name. <laughs> I mean... Beyond just the fact he's from Croydon, right. the name, you know... Meliodas. Yes. It, mm. It's not quite, you know, brown and cheery, no. is it? No, no. It is, it is a good villain name. Yeah. Yeah. So Meliodas and Brass, after everybody else has made themselves scarce, discuss Grand Britain's unification attempts. And to cut a long story short, Meliodas wants the Count's support in terms of political intelligence and advice, whereas Count Brass essentially just wants to be Switzerland in this. We don't want to get involved... Refuses or the to offer, yeah, or the Vatican, yeah. Refuses to offer support. <laughs> <I, yeah. laughs> Refuses to offer his support, and, and Melidas isn't really too impressed with this. He's not obviously not used to being turned down. But again, Count Brass comes off as I don't know appeasement might be the wrong word, but he's, he open, openly admires the grand strategy of Grand Bretagne. And at the end of the chapter, there's an admission that he actually likes Melidas, even though Melidas himself is obviously getting irritable by the Count, not just rolling over and giving him what he needs. So again, you've kind of got this, this double-edged sword with Count Brass. He's intelligent, articulate, a political mover and shaker. He's heroic, he's the, gar- he's the guardian of his peers. But he's also a little bit myopic and aloof regarding the events in Europe. Or we could just be, you know, um, optimistic. Mm. And also, you know, he's he's, he's done fighting. Mm. He's fought all over. He's seen what happens. He's seen what it brings. It's like, well, yeah, unification would be all right. This bit's all right. He's clearly got some dickhead traits, but haven't we all got some dickhead traits? He comes across as kind of authentic and mm. chilled out and, you know, comfortable with this place, but, you know, yeah. he'd jump into a bullring to fight someone if they needed it. He's that kind of... He's not looking for trouble. He's not, oh, I've, see, I've seen the coat of arms and we're going to stab him in his sleep. Yeah. It was, you know, it's very much, we'll take it as it comes. If there's any doubt as to how things are going to go, chapter four is titled... The fight. The fight at Castle Brass. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. you know, we've got a fairly good idea of what's coming. Spoilers. Yeah. And essentially, so, Malaya just stays a week, enjoys the hospitality of the Count. Bo Gentle's got his suspicions. Bo Gentle thinks that he's, uh, he's making moves on Yazelda. Turns out he's correct. Brass asks Bo Gentle to keep an eye on the pair of them. Can I just... Yazelda, though as intelligent as her father, lacked both his experience and his normally good judgement of character. She found even the Baron's infamous reputation attractive and at the same time could not believe that all the stories about him were true. Uh. It's like Tinder in a book. <laughs> so, you know, so she, bless her, a little 18-year-old pretty girl, and that's the, that is the only, 
Because with every other character, I know that's several lines for a woman, but with every other character, he says a lot in a few lines. Mm. This poor, naive little innocent, like every guy who knocks at the fucking castle, is like, <laughs> all right, do you want to get married? Yeah. All right, do you want to get married? Not, you know, what? I, I wonder... Nothing else. Just, you know, the first guy, she's like, yeah, you'll do. I hear you like killing children, mm. but from your outfit, I don't see that in you at all. Mm. I mean, that moustache isn't giving me any fucking red signs, mm. warning signs at all. And then, you know, without going into the next book too much, you know, the next guy knocks on and goes, hi, I'm here to see your dad. Yeah. She's like, well, have you thought about loving me? And it's just that level of neediness, although for the 60s for writing, because there's 21st century writers who are still writing women worse, mm. she did get her own few lines. Mm. Because she did at least... She was as intelligent as her father, mm. but lacked his experience and his normally good judgment of character. And from memory, and we're leaping ahead to three books here, I think she does actually get involved in the battle and, and get stuck in. So she's not just a damsel in distress all the time. Yes. However, that said, it is definitely the case that horrendous murder of children turns up, but he looks pretty swish. <laughs> Yeah. I I'm mean, not a very good judge of character. I imagine the guy's got an amazing sense of humour. Yeah. Which, if this was Eddings, we would have seen to the nth degree. Yeah. Yeah, we'd have known exactly what he likes joking about, but because it's... Now, you know, did you ever see the Kenneth Branagh adapta- film adaptation of Much Ado About Nothing? Yes, loved it. Do you remember Keanu Reeves in his leather pants? Yes. Keanu Reeves, Malidus. If... if Malidus turns up and texts his elbow. I thought you were going to say it was Branner. I'm like, no, you know, no. he would have to have that level of wit yeah. about him yeah. for this 18th If we're talking point. casting couch again. Yeah. If Malidus turns if up at the castle blessed. and he texts his helmet off and it's basically, I don't know, Keanu Reeves back then or even Keanu Reeves John Wick style right now, all in black armour and leather. Let's just go back to Keanu and leather. Yeah, you know. Stay there Could you forgive the baby killing? If he said he hadn't done it, well, <laughs> I asked him. If he convinced you. Yeah. He said he hadn't done it. Yeah. 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 I said, what about Facebook? He says yeah. here, saw so, some pictures, he went fake news. Yeah. So we need he, to give his elder something of a break, don't we? He, if it, if do we know, accept that he looks probably, like Keanu Reeves in Much Ado About Nothing in Love It's just the moustache, really, that's put me off. Uh, it's my... <laughs> yeah. The, the moustache makes me think more of Jason King. Yeah, so if he turns up and he's basically Jason King in armour, maybe, maybe not so much. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> even after Bo Gentle warns Brass of Melidus's nature and intentions towards his elder, Count Brass is still quite resistive and defensive of Melidus and even accuses Bo Gentle of being a nervous old woman. Mm. Yeah, so there's an interesting insight from Bo Gentle into what the Count's thinking, which I think is worth looking at. Bo Gentle wondered to himself if the Count's refusal to see the truth was sponsored by a secret wish to know nothing at all of the character of those who ruled Gran Bretagne, or it was simply a father's common inability to see in his child what was perfectly evident to others. Bo Gentle decided to keep a careful eye on both Baron Melidus and Yselda in the future. He could not believe that the Count's judgment was correct in the case of the man who had caused the Massacre of Liège, who had given the order for the sack of Sarbrook, and whose perverse appetites were the horror of every whispering scullion from North Cape to Tunis. As he had said, the Count had lived too long in the country, breathing the clean rural air. Now he could not recognise the stink of corruption, even when he smelled it. So, you know, Bo Gentle's got a good point there. She is kind of, you know, falling for a bit of a rotter. But Melidus and Count Brass continue to converse, and the Baron lays out the plans of Grand Britain to conquer the known world, the mysterious Asia Communista, the location of the great MacGuffin of the books, the room staff. And the room staff actually ends up being mentioned across a whole host of different mock-up books. I think it pops up in Elric. It's probably the biggest single MacGuffin other than Stormbringer the Sword itself in, uh, in Mocock. And Count Brass does finally start to feel slightly unsettled by it, but it takes a direct threat to actually get him to take action. Because meanwhile, his elder is totally buying into Melidus' Romeo shtick and is meeting him on the sly. Fortunately, Bo Gentle is on the case because when it turns sour and he tells her that basically she's his and he wants to take her away and when she's resistant and says, oh no, my father has to approve of this, he basically starts really dragging her about and roughing her up and saying, you're coming with me, love. Fortunately, Bo Gentle's there. He's been stalking the pair and he intervenes Sadly, he's no match for Melidus, and he gets uh, done in, effectively. And Melidus drags Yzelda into the main hall. Fortunately, Count Brass is there. Now, at this stage, Count Brass turns up clad, as the text suggests, 
only in a simple robe, holding his broadsword. And I cannot help when I read that of just thinking of him stood there in a dressing gown. Has to be a dressing gown. Otherwise but naked, with his sword held up in the air, looking like a bronzed, semi-naked god, and threatening Melidus. Melidus, like a classic villain, of course, doesn't fancy matching his short sword, so he's like, mm, um, you know, I don't want to fight you, Baron. You know, she's good, good villain shtick. And I'd, actually, Peter Wingard stroke Jason King would carry off that much better, much better than Keanu Reeves. Once I said his name, all I can see is Tom Cruise, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, after this, we'll Google Jason King, and then you can see what I'm talking about. So, Count Brat is enraged by now, and he's even more enraged when his elder tells him that uh, Melidus has killed Burgentle. But his moral code makes him throw Melidus a proper sword, and it's game on, and it's fight time. Which, of course, because he's basically a hero, Count Brass wins. But Burgentle turns up, he ain't dead, and Count Brass shows Melidus mercy and allows him to leave. Which, possibly something of an error on Count Brass's part. It's one of those uh, plotdevice.tm, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And again, it, it's Walcock, because he was probably having a great time with the beginning bit. It's like, what am I going to do about? Oh, fuck it. Let, let him leave. And I don't want to do any spoilers for the rest of the book, but it's like, oh, fuck it, I'm not writing another one. Yeah. Which, you know, to be fair to the guy, at least he's used... It's not like Marvel, they'll kill them, they'll bring them fucking back. Or, oh, it's a new <laughs> yeah. universe now. Or even Star Trek. Oh, that never happened. Just fuck off. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is the genuine, oh, he got away. But he's going to be back. Mm. Unlike uh, Feist, who they live a whole fucking long life, and then the children are like exactly like the dads, and the children are like exactly like the dads. Or well, Weddings, God bless him, whatever book he's writing. It's, it's strange how there's always these three guys, and there's one woman, and aren't they all... And they're like a similar personality to them. So it is... You know, let him leave. Let him fucking leave. They don't have to pretend like his son came out, mm. but his son was just like him, and they were going to read four fucking chapters about how his son grew up. And You see where I'm coming from? Mm-hmm. So it's classic Morkoff. I love it. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, tell you what, I see what you were doing, and if you had killed my friend, I would absolutely have done for you, and I'd have heard about what you've done before, and I know you work with the enemy, and uh, I'll see you next time. Be a rain. He walks mm. back in the castle. You're right. Mm. We had a chat. It's it's sorted. But even now, even after all this, even after almost having to kill a count or a baron um, of Croydon, of all places, the, the count retribution Brass would be terrible. Still remains ever so slightly um, naive about things. He says, "You were right, Lord Gentle. Both Yzelda and I were beguiled by the man. I'll have no more emissaries from Granby's hand visit Castle Brass." You realise the Dark Empire must be fought, destroyed, poor gentle ass, hopefully. I did not say that. Let it do what it will. We will have no further trouble from Grand Bretagne or Baron Melidus. You're wrong, poor gentle said with conviction. And in his dark carriage, as it bumped through the night towards the northern border of the Camargue, Baron Melidus spoke aloud to himself and swore an oath by the most mysterious sacred object he knew. He swore by the rune staff, that lost artefact said to contain all the secrets of destiny, that he would get Count Brass into his power by any means possible, that he would possess Yzelda, and that the command would become one great furnace in which all who inhabited it would perish. This he swore by the rune staff, and thus the destiny of Baron Melidus, Count Brass, Yzelda, the Dark Empire, and all who were now and would later be concerned with the events in Castle Brass was irrevocably decided. The play was cast, the stage set, the curtain raised. Now the mummers must enact their destiny. And thus ends book one, a very short book, of The Jewel in the Skull. And we've not even met Dorian Hartmoon yet, but that'll come next time. And so, thoughts, Lady Natasha, on book one of The Jewel in the Skull. I did love it. And probably, I mean, you might see different... Well, I actually think we see the same, because mm. obviously Count Brass and this one is the more interesting character. Mm. Um... Probably my favourite book of the three. Yeah. Uh, as you say, it sets it, it opens it, it introduces the characters, it develops them well. I mean, Hawk Moon has his trials, but obviously for the nature of the books, he doesn't have the plot arc that mm. these guys have. Mm. Um, obviously, you know, his elders... Well, 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 well that's... Yeah, the next we'll time. discuss it later, but he doesn't really have much of an arc, does he? He doesn't, not in the two books. So in terms of how it's opened, how it's presented, all the things that you can think about in terms of its so 
uh, social and political commentary in its psychology because you know if Zelda wasn't as good a judge of character as a dad but then he wasn't a good judge of character as this sleazy looking Keanu Reeves in the mm. mm, leather trousers yeah because actually Count Brass is is really quite enamoured of the Baron himself isn't yeah he? but the thing he's is he's been seduced by him but he, he's old and he's tired and he's competent and it, he recognises that the world's full of bullshit and which bullshit do you choose to fight mm. and it's like well bring it here and I'll fight it but mm. otherwise you know if you show me a smiley face I'll show you my smiley face because life's too fucking short to mm. be he wasn't even going to fight the Baragoon he mm. was like yeah if you want to go away if I don't have to fight you and that's a level of maturity that mm. isn't often seen in these old kings who are happy to go to war or not end wars or you know whatever else the fantasy world suggests that old kings do, mm. which isn't drink and drive or, you know, yeah. paedophilia. Yeah. It's, it's that kind of wisdom and satisfaction in life. And he's, you know, he's strong and he's able to protect. And I think there was a point in the bullfight after he jumped in that, you know, very gentle with his inability to hold a fucking tongue in his head. <laughs> <laughs> he just says, well, because he says, well, you know, I've got to save the people that, you know, I care about. It's yeah. like, well, if you care about that, why don't you care about... Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah. So it's it's that little... Do you know what it really reminded me of? Probably by the end of the three books as opposed to just the first book. But it's that episodic approach to storytelling that Star Wars... I don't know, four, five, six, seven, and I haven't really fucking up to it now. Tried and failed. Mm. They did it, and everyone felt like it was a trailer. Mm. You know, I try and watch it, and it's like, I remember watching, obviously, the first three a million times. Yeah. This is a separate podcast, obviously. Yes. Yeah. And then the second three several times. But, like, the second three, already it felt like you'd seen the trailers, you'd seen the best bits of the films, but you watched it, and it all felt like a trailer because it yeah. jumped about, and now you're on this planet, now you're on that planet, and then there's these people, and there's these people. And that's the that's me editing out a whole host of other, you know, I'll just say Jar Jar Binks and move the fuck yeah. on with everybody's life. Yeah. Um, whereas this was episodic. I remember going to see Star Wars... The first one. Remember when they bought it out, THC sound? Mm -hmm. THC sound. THX. <laughs> THX. <laughs> you wish. You wish it was THC sound. That will be the next. You heard it here first, Disney. So when we have those cinemas up and running, you just pump it into the fucking room. Uh, I'm down for a free ticket. <laughs> but yeah, so the THX sound. Moving on. So THX sound when Star Wars came out. was um, We drove all the way down to Star City, which... I can tell you, having been there recently, doesn't fucking hold after 20 years. <laughs> um, but we drove all the way down there, we bought our tickets online, we went in, prepared to like be amazed by the size of the screen, because mm. first time I'd watched it was probably four, and it was on ITV at Christmas, mm. and we had a, when they had big tins of roses. It was a thing, it was like a real experience, mm. and then you love it, and then we bought the videos, and then we bought the DVDs, and you know, like, that bullshit. So we, we sat there... And it was amazing, and we got to watch it, and the only point you noticed that they had this special sound effect was at the very fucking end, where they blow up the Death Star, and it sort of goes off left, and so the stereo, more than anything else, made it sound like, you know, like as it exploded past you, it, yeah. it timed itself around the room, which was beautiful. Yeah. But the rest of it, as I discovered, is all fucking music. Mm. So I picked this up, having, I don't know, the last fantasy book I read... Oh, um... Yeah, so so when Jim Butcher starts listening to it, he needs to fucking up his typing <laughs> skills because he was doing really well for a couple of years of like the Dresden Israel, Files guy. Dresden Files, and then yeah. he started a um, cyberpunk, not right. cyberpunk, um, steampunk. Right. So we start fabulous, great start. That was years ago. Apparently, he's bringing another book out next year. But he'd gone through this period of issuing a book on the uh, uh, the Alexa. I don't know. There was a fantasy, um, there's a fantasy series, there were six books, start and finish, um, the Code or something, Alex, I can't remember now, too, too little one, it's only in the front room. Um, so he did a six book fantasy, start to finish, and then he did um, Jim Butcher, and he was bringing out two books a year, so you knew every year you'd have two fucking awesome books, mm. but all of them have got a lot more talking in it, they've got a lot more interpersonal interaction, yeah, they've got some introspection, but they're also bigger books, yeah. so to get to this, it was that Star Wars experience of picking it up and thinking, I thought it was going to be more talking, mm. particularly in the next two books, as opposed to the first two books, because the guy's travelling, and fair enough, but mm. the people he meets, I mean, he made friends, I don't want to spoil it too much this is something to tune in for in the future um, he made friends with a little guy 
because I don't want to spoil it. Mm -hmm. And they travelled for months and months together and they risked their lives for each other. Mm. But they must have said six or seven words and they just said he kind of liked him. Mm. And then they should have gone their own separate ways, but they kind of decided to stay together. Mm. And it's that Star Wars kind of drop in. The story is the story. The people are almost incidentals Mm -hmm. sometimes to it. Um, So the first book being so very... It's got probably more talking in the first book than the next two books entirely yeah. in terms of like, you know, and he said this and he said that, or even introspective thinking, because mm. for most of it, I guess the guy is mentally numb. Mm. And I think that really repeats in the rest of the Moorcock books. As you say, some of them are literally written on the toilet because mm. you read them and you're like, what the... F-? Mm. Like, it's... Well, na- naturally, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be doing, you know, this, this podcast is really just the introduction and covering book one. But we'll cover books two and three as the next podcast. Um, but I think after that, it'd be really, really interesting if we did something like uh, the first book within Stormbringer, Dead God's Homecoming, which is an introduction to Elric from from round about the same time. So we could do that uh, to contrast, you know, be between, between the two. Because yeah. I, I personally think, and I think I think I, I believed it at the time. I personally think that. Jewel in the Skull was probably my favourite of that period of Moorcock in terms of introduction to new characters. But I'm really looking forward to going through that voyage of, of rereading them all again and and reevaluating them. Because I never expected that we would have such a big conversation and debate regarding the nature of Camp pages. Brasses. 40 pages. Yeah, yeah. And the nature of Camp Brasses. And how many kind of books dilemma. can you do that for, like, 50 years later? And mm. I think that speaks to Moorcock. Mm. And why he isn't, you know, as I think we covered at the start, two words, tits and dragons, yeah. why he isn't still even remembered, mm. like, for people who, th- even the people who actually think they, they're into fantasy, yeah. not just people who've seen a couple of episodes of Thrones and thought yeah. it was a lie. Yeah. Um, why they don't know him, mm. but they've read or they've heard about. I mean, Shannara, when you think about all the shit they're converting onto TV now, mm. and you're like, well, yeah, but that was a great first book. Mm. So, yeah, science fiction fantasy as a genre, what's taken off is the stuff that's got the merch behind it, the stuff that gets a TV sale. And I personally feel that fantasy is always, and, I, and you know, please write to me because I've got free time, but, you know, I think it's best reading. Mm. I think sci-fi tends to translate best to the visual mm. because when you get a really good sci-fi writer, I mean, God love you, but you can't help but spend three chapters telling me how the fucking lift works, and it's not a real lift. It's an imaginary lift that doesn't mm. exist yet. And I understand when you look at the Arthur C. Clarke story and how he's influenced our, you know, our smartphone world, and not necessarily for the good or the bad, but that's been mm. a part of it. He worked with NASA, he worked with, you know, the big companies because he's the ideas guy. Mm. So, yeah, to somebody, they want to know what happens with that fucking imaginary lift. Mm. I don't. So I'm happy to see, you know, I remember watching Babylon 5, God bless them, in the 90s, and the the... CGI that was on it when they got in that lift and it shot sideways and you saw the whole of the station and you had these big sweeping shots that cost them hundreds of thousands. Straczynski, if you tag him, will listen to this because mm. we've mentioned him because he's like that and he's a really nice man. Mm. Um, and that just blew me away because that was the first of it. But if you'd have read that, that would have been like 30 fucking pages describing as the lift went along yeah. at the speeds, but, you know, with, with the dampeners, they managed to not feel it, and so you didn't see them slide like an enterprise, yeah. but in the background, you saw where they grew the food, and you saw how they ate the food, and you saw how they were self-sustaining, and it's boring just telling you about it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So so sci-fi works really well in the visual. It can also be done badly, but it works really well in the visual, where it's fantasy, because you've got the flamingos, and you've got the grey sky, and you've got the the references to France, but also you've got the references to, you know, like sorcery and being on a pyramid in France, which we don't, we haven't With been told, machines. we yeah. haven't been told exists. Yeah. And then you've got this kind of mix of magic and, and science and whatever that comes through. Yeah. And there's that, that you can't accurately, or they don't bother to, when they convert things that were good in books to films, mm. they miss it all out because they're like, ah, and he points his finger and it goes pow and you don't mm. understand. That said, some people take it too far and they actually try to teach you how to channel imaginary energy mm. uh, naming no names, though you could you know, like, but this isn't a real thing so I don't need to feel it in my toes and then feel myself connect to the grass and then and then. but every fucking time I'm like, the bad guy would have killed you by now, why don't you pull out your magic sword, my friend, and just smite them, you know, so it's it's a, it's a genre It'd be interesting to see if they could make a Warcock TV series. Well, that's the interesting thing, isn't it? It's, it's like, 
everything that's currently in like the fantasy zeitgeist, as you've said, is to do with properties and TV shows. And I think there is a lot of fantasy out there that's that's particularly successful. And people like Joe Abercrombie and Scott Lynch, who sell a lot of books. I've not read any of them myself, but I know people who are very much into them, which are kind of not... I don't think there are TV shows about those things, but it will be interesting to see if, if this prime TV show based upon the history of the room staff might actually result in I just brand wonder, new editions of Mocock books hitting the shelves in Waterstone. I, I, I have a fear about it, I guess, that because of the way that... So they've got Tits and Dragons out, they've got the did Shannara, didn't they? Didn't they do? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a real risk that we end up getting. That, it's going to gonna hit at the wrong time. Quality. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to hit the wrong time. I mean, they tried to, the Dresden Files, God yeah. bless them. And the people who made it didn't read the fucking books. And so they had the right people in the in the cast, but they didn't put them in the right roles because they didn't realise that the blonde was blonde and the yeah. dark hair. And it was, it, I mean, it's shit TV, which let's face it, we all love, yeah. but it's not anything to do. So it's never taken off. So the same people yeah. who've never heard about, you know, Dresden Files and are missing out on a fabulously planned unlike fucking dragons who didn't bother playing and told us to wrote them on the toilet as he yeah. felt like it this plot arc that this guy knows exactly where he's taking it um, which you don't always get mm. so they're going to make Magician from Feist that's going on mm. the TV Shannara I read it I read the first one I think I made it through the next one and a bit yeah. so that's the difference with Morcock you can pick it up you can hate it yeah. you're still done in a fucking hour because yeah. if the b- books are bad you'll flip through it and it'll be done and yeah. you're fine with some of these it's I, I, you know, as a person, I try to let go of like resentment. However, Robert Jordan, the fucking wheel of fucking time. Getting made into a TV series. Fuck them. Yeah. With a big stick. Because yeah. the first three books sold me a dream. The next five books that I made it through did not live up to. Mm. And by that point, I'd lost so much of my life. Hope, like even waiting for the book to come out because it was that age. It was mm. post Walcott, but you know, pre other things. And it was you waited for those books and you went out and you bought it and you spent your hard earned money and you rushed home with it and you're like, what's going to happen to him? And by the end, you're like, Fuck them all! You know, I hope you all. You know, I hope a meteor hits the earth and you all. Well, spoiler alert: a friend of a friend wants to do a Wheel of Time podcast. Really? So, if you're group, available, group session. As long as I only need to talk up to book eight. But then, to be fair, Brian Sanderson, because the guy, even he got bored and died. Yeah. Like, he couldn't even make it to the end of his fucking story, and frankly, none of us should. Yeah. But Brian, Brandon Sanderson, that was it. So I've read his books because, you know, iTunes makes everything accessible these yeah. days, doesn't it? So I've read his books and God bless him, he's formulaic to a nth degree. He's not bad, but he's not in any way considered good. Yeah. Um, and he's finished them and I'm like, yeah, you've probably written them all right and I'm hoping that you've started with a fucking plan to end them and you've closed the arc and maybe one day I'll read the ones he's finished. But Moorcock, as I said at the start, to bring it all back and to close it, pick up anyone, you're either going to get a good one or a bad one. Mm. Either way, you're probably going to have a laugh. Mm. There'll be a couple of sentences in there that can take you on a Hawkwind-style kind of mental <laughs> expedition. Right. Yeah. Like, if you just want to, like, it's a philosophy of potentials. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. I mean, the guy's a fucking genius. Um, he's up there with Straczynski. He's up there with Tolkien. Doesn't have to be the same, just yeah. has to be quality. And I don't know... Why more people aren't into him? It's their loss. Maybe. Well, I think that's that's a great summing up. Um, so we will get together again um, to do the remainder of the duel in the skull. But in the meantime, well, I'll see you on the Moonbeam Roads. My the Baragoons. <laughs> Thanks to Tash there for being such a good host and a great companion for episode 2. I can also heartily recommend Angostura Rum, as fine an example of Trinidadian produce as Natasha herself. She'll be back when we cover the remainder of the Jewel in the Skull, when we'll actually meet Hawkmoon for the first time. I'd also like to thank the folks on Twitter for their lovely feedback and encouragement. It's been very gratifying. At the end of the day, this is just a hobby, but it really helps to get such positivity from folks when they've listened and enjoyed our yakking. Thanks also to my buddy Tom, who emailed me to comment on the hero-anti-hero angle that was discussed in our last episode of The Dreaming City, and also helpfully explain the origins of the term negromantic that caused us some head-scratching in the last episode. Tom said, Elric sounds like a Nietzschean hero, i.e. he acts in his own interests and is not constrained by somebody else's idea of morality. A total dick, in other words. 
By the way, nigromante, nigromancia are the Spanish words for necromancer and necromancy, and Spanish is full of Latin-derived words. Thanks for that, Tom. At the end of the day, this isn't an academic or highbrow analysis of Mocock and his works. It's just some old muckers supping and gabbing about stuff they enjoy, so please feel free to correct us when we head off down dodgy alleyways or display rank, drunken ignorance. Big thanks are also due to Don Dennis, Walls Fior on Twitter, and co-host of the excellent On RPGs podcast for all of his excellent technical advice, tips, and encouragement since I posted the introductory and Dreaming City episodes. I hope to have Don on at some point to talk gaming. Last but not least, though, massive gratitude to Neil, at Nelbet1 on Twitter, not only for his advice and tips, but also for taking on the task of clearing up and sorting out the sound on this episode. He did a bloody terrific job and made it listenable. As it happens, it turns out that whilst recording in a tiled kitchen with creaky wooden chairs, three happy dogs, and a pile of trinny food and rum is an afternoon very well spent, it's not an ideal setting for recording a podcast, especially when I'm such a massive amateur when it comes to mic setups and other technical shit I just don't understand. Cheers, Neil. Also very grateful for Neil and Laws allowing me to use some of their music from back in the day to bookend the episodes. Coming up soon, Laws will be back as we look at 1972's Elric of Melnibonet, or maybe the first Erico's book, we'll see. We'll also have a couple more guests heading in to meet me in the Darien Tom's roof garden to drink some tea, eat some cake, and chew the fat over all things more cocky and, and otherwise. In the meantime, I appreciate you taking the time to listen, and I'll see you on the Moonbeam Rods.